They cannot inflate the money supply. But this is not taught. Do you think the bankers would want you to know? I had been uh, an owner of life insurance uh, from almost the get-go. First policy uh, I ever had, uh, uh, my dad bought for me when I was 13 years old. New York Life. He paid the first annual premium and then he took me aside when the next one came due and said, I, I started this for you. It's yours, you pay the premium. Well, when I was 16 years old, I bought my second policy. So I had been buying uh, respectable amounts of life insurance and I noticed that I could get the money at uh, five, six and 8% from three different life insurance companies. Only problem was it's the same thing as down at the bank, when you ask them how much of a check can you write, they ask you how much do you have in you. That's how big a check you can write. <laughs> uh, so uh, I had been paying uh, respectable premiums, but nowhere near what I should be because your need for finance during your lifetime is much greater than your need for protection. And that is the... Uh, essence of what I discovered out there, that people had totally overlooked that aspect. And so I saw that I needed to uh, up my premiums big time. And from that I could borrow and pay off the snakes and dragons, and then later on pay off uh, the loans and such. So it's been a long-term project uh, there, you know, uh, uh, some 35 years or so by now. I was looking at things the way the world looks at them, about money and about banking and such. And that uh, if I would reorganize my thinking, buy lots of life insurance, borrow from it and pay off the snakes and dragons, that that would be the solution. And so uh, that was the genesis of the infinite banking concept. The process that you pioneered, that you developed and founded is not to be sensationalized. And in fact, oh, it's heavens, ridiculously no. simple. Yes, yes, yes. And it's not a get rich quick scheme at all. To the contrary, it's something that's always growing. Uh, this is where my uh, forestry uh, background helps out a little bit. Uh, consider the way uh, a tree grows. Uh, it uh, is always uh, growing until one or two things happens. It dies or harvested one or the other, but it's always getting better. Well, that's the way uh, life insurance policy is. It's always getting better. It cannot go backward. I was so elated when I came back from uh, uh, the Far East that uh, fall of 1993, and seeing that article, I said, my word, this is exactly what I've been uh, teaching uh, here of infinite banking concepts, using life insurance as the uh, primary location of your capital, that uh, you automatically do what uh, Stern Stewart was uh, teaching, and you don't have to pay those high uh, consulting fees. <laughs> <laughs> All you got to do is just buy lots of life insurance. You say in the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, that there are many financial geniuses out there that would say that participating dividend paying whole life or life insurance in general is a poor place to store money. And you've said often that people can reach absurd conclusions with limited information. Can you tell us the weed eater story? When I do the seminars uh, all over the United States and Canada, I usually uh, started off by telling people, this is an exercise in imagination, reason, logic and prophecy. So let's start with the subject of logic. Now, uh, for you folks who uh, are not familiar with what goes on in Alabama, there is a disease here, it's called football. If you move to Alabama, they're gonna pester you to death until you decide whether you're gonna root for Alabama or Auburn. This is essential knowledge uh, in this area. Okay, so let's go to uh, the item of logic. Okay. Well, first of all, because of the intense rivalry, there are Auburn jokes here. So there's these two uh, Auburn guys uh, in school. Uh, they're discussing what they're going to take next session in school. One said, I just signed up for this new course that Auburn's offering in logic. His friend said, what's that? 
He says, look, I can learn a great deal about you in a relatively short period of time with just a few questions and um, the use of logic. For instance, do you own a weed eater? And he says, yes. Well, logic tells me you're a homeowner. Yes. Well, logic tells me you might be married then. Yes. Well, logic tells me you might even have children. Yes, we have two. He said, well, uh, logic tells me that uh, you're heterosexual. Said, yes. You see, see how it works now? Yes, I'm going to take that course too. He signed up. Talking with somebody a couple of days later, he says, I just signed up that new course, Auburn's often in logic. The other party says, well, what's that? <clears throat> he said, look, I can learn a great deal about you in just a few minutes with just a few basic questions and the use of logic. For instance, do you own a weed eater? No. Logic tell me you're probably homosexual. <laughs> you see, people take a little bit of information and they reach absurd conclusions. And that's mainly because of all the financial geniuses that exist out there today that uh, they've all got their particular agenda and uh, they like to uh, uh, ridicule something. And uh, there's some big time personalities out there that have made an enormous uh, career out of ridiculing life insurance. And people listen to this sort of stuff. But uh, what's happening is that they're just telling half-truths and that's all. We got to address the disease that uh, infects the minds of most people out there regarding life insurance. And uh, you can distill it by uh, the definition, uh, you don't want to pay very much life insurance premiums because that's a bad place to put money. Uh, that is the hardest thing to overcome out there because it's been instilled in the minds of, the, of most of the people that uh, are adults uh, at this particular time. Uh, one of my favorite people is Maynard Keynes, you know, <laughs> who's just screwed up the entire world that uh, he was involved in life insurance in England. And uh, he destroyed a company back there with the same kind of thinking that prevails out there today. How many years were you in the life insurance industry, Nelson, before the process of becoming your own banker was conceived? Well, I started the insurance business October 1, 1964. And uh, we're talking about 1980, so do the third grade arithmetic, yeah. And nobody from the life insurance industry sat down with you and presented you with no, the solution? Not at all. To the contrary, they're concentrating on the death benefit and uh, the usual things of production and uh, uh, we look at me type of activity that uh, prevails in the business. That and uh, complicated by the fact that they also, uh, I guess, addicted to, uh, they subscribe to government programs of some kind. And if there's anything that's antithetical to this, it's government programs. When you go pay a life insurance premium, that's something that you worked for to earn, right? Correct. All right, so now you have money. Yes. That is a token of the value of your efforts that you put out. Yes. All right, now you give it to a life insurance company. They put it to work in uh, various and sundry places. Uh, it can put it together to work with you as I describe in my book. They cannot inflate the money supply, but this is not taught. Do you think the bankers would want you to know? No, to the contrary. And you've said uh, many times, and you've also indicated in your book, Building Your Warehouse of Wealth, that your wealth must reside somewhere. Somewhere, yes. And what better place to have it reside than inside of an entity that cannot inflate? But it's not talked about. It's not talked about in universities. Uh, it is not talked about in home offices of life insurance companies. That's the tragedy. To the contrary, uh, home offices have pursued uh, other things out there like managing assets and so forth, uh, and like uh, tax qualified plans, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I should, that should never occur really when you think it through. And it's so simple. What message would you want to share with 
life insurance carriers out there today who have a lengthy history with participating dividend paying whole life contracts, what message would you like to share with those life insurance companies? Study your product, good grief. I remember so vividly, uh, I spent 23 years with Equitable in New York. And uh, I knew the uh, home office uh, principal very well. Uh, one of them I didn't know all that well, uh, but the, the head guy I did. And uh, they were trying to be everything to everybody. So here was this big meeting over in Atlanta. There's over 500 people in attendance. 400 was from the real estate business. Now, uh, the uh, president of the company uh, said, uh, Oh, we're going to invite innovation and uh, so forth. And so I uh, brought him face to face with the fact that I'd been trying to get them to understand this five years and I was shouted down. <laughs> and I saw that this, this is hopeless. I will never do this again. And so that led me to uh, abandon them. They were totally unteachable. Well, I think you'd be quite pleased to know that there's an incalculable number of people who have embraced this process and their lives, their financial situations are permanently improved. That's the most rewarding thing of all, when you see people catch on and work themselves out of that darkness. No reward is better. So when you think about part of your legacy and in, in what you've instilled in your children, and what's taking place in your family line, what comes up for you when you think of that? What comes up? Yeah. What gets you excited about seeing how they're utilizing this concept in their lives as your, you know, your children are starting to really embracing this uh, in their life? Joy. <laughs> joy of knowing that uh, they've caught on, whatever. See, uh, Kim and Dave have been married, uh, 79 was when they got married. First thing Dave had to do is buy significant uh, life insurance policy. <laughs> it seems to me that there has to be a fundamental understanding that there's a difference between the process and the vehicle that's utilized to implement the process because in the financial world, participating dividend paying whole life policies have been uh, a product that has been compared to other investment products. And so the, the key teaching point must be that a person understands that a process is never an investment. True, exactly. But you see, the problem is with words. Uh, we got the word insurance. Now, every other form of insurance out there is expressing uh, what would happen if uh, something should happen during a time frame. For instance, should this house burn during a time frame? if and time frame, all right? A life is not if, it's when. It should never have been called life insurance because that's not what it is. It's really a personal monetary system uh, with a death benefit thrown in on the side just for the heck of it. That's a rather long name, but they've been far more accurate we wouldn't have all this nonsense. But see, again, that's the problem is that uh, man, for some reason or another, has that tendency to change the meaning of words. For instance, in our country today, uh, the definition of home ownership is that you have title to a piece of property, but you owe more on it than it's worth. That's home ownership. No way. But yet that is a courtesy. People don't realize uh, what a slave they have become as a result of the way that they're taught and as a result of how they implement the felonious teaching that they run into. It's not teaching, it's indoctrination. So this is all about how one finances things in life, which can certainly include investments. Sure, but again, yes. Yeah, in fact, any investment should be made from here. Well, they think that everything that comes along has to be a tax qualified plan of some kind. And CPAs are taught this explicitly. And that's unbelievable. And they spent all kind of money learning how to be a CPA uh, to come up with this nonsense. I don't understand. And so they think 
that everything that comes along, the government can take it over. Shucks, uh, De Soto uh, points out it's well over 200 years old. Uh, the IRS code's only been around since 1913. <laughs> Life insurance is not uh, a function of the IRS code at Rev Canada. <laughs> I've also heard you say when you're explaining that wherever wealth is accumulated, someone will try to steal it. Yeah. Uh, one of the early books that I uh, got into when I first got in life insurance business was uh, he was pointing out how in civilization uh, there was a period of time when people uh, knew how to make asphalt and later on they le they forgot how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Weird things like that happen. Well, this same sort of phenomenon happened out there in the uh, financial world. You could be putting money at work at interest somewhere. And unless you're earning more than that, you're not showing a profit. Right. It's that simple. Now, stockholders perceived that this is a business that's going to keep getting better every day, no matter what. Our cash values have been growing today. That's right. Yeah. Now, tomorrow they're going to be growing. That's right. When y'all are on the way home, well, here in a few days, it's going to be growing while you're there. That's right. Always growing. All right. But you see, they didn't understand this. In the book, you include an example that's titled Equipment Financing, which is an extremely powerful example because it's really the only example in the book that illustrates the use of policy loans. Mm -hmm. Right. And... If I may ask you, Nelson, in the first illustration, you're showing the outcome if the insurance company simply administers the policy all on its own. Yeah, we got to have a starting point. Right. We're going to be using the tool of life insurance to uh, carry out uh, the concept of banking. Well, we got to understand how uh, uh, the stuff works and how that uh, you can capitalize the system for a period of years. In this particular example, it can be done in four years, but in all candor, if I were advising a client of mine, I'd say take at least seven or eight, maybe 10 years or so. The more you capitalize, the better, but also uh, you gotta build a system big enough to accommodate everything that you do. And there's no way that one policy will do that. It's impossible. How would people overcome that where we have an industry where the life insurance companies have that, that cap on how much premium can go into a policy in relation to the policy owner's income? Oh, that came about back there in, I guess, in the 80s or so. Uh, when there were, well, I can't remember the letters that came along. Well, what happened was that people discovered that they could buy uh, real high price life insurance like single premium and stuff like that because every calculation of a life insurance premium begins with the calculation of a single premium policy. All starts there. Everything else is a variation of that. Uh, I is how many years can you finance this or how many years can you rent this? And so that's all. I don't know about one case of people actually losing money buying life insurance. 